Hey, welcome to Life Church Online. We're super excited that you've chosen to join with us today. Hey, if anything stands out to you during worship or the message, feel free to drop it in the comments below. It encourages everybody else and we love to see it too. Anyway, let's jump right into worship. Oh, 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 oh,
Hey, Life Church, so great to have you online, and I'm, I'm just honored and blessed that I could be here and be part of your online services. They've been powerful. I have the, had the privilege and opportunity of watching a couple of these messages and the online services that Life Church is producing. And first of all, it is wonderful. But secondly, how awesome is Life Church? I love the name change. I mean, everything that this church does is producing and showing off life. And so I'm just so blessed to be part of this church, to be blessed and part of what they're doing, especially on their online services. So we're so glad that you came uh, to join us this day. And I know Pastor Andreas and Ermery, wonderful dear friends of ours, so grateful that they've entrusted this camera to us for this time period. And so today, let's just get into the Word of God. We're excited for what the Lord wants to share with us as we dive in today. So let's pray before we begin and we'll, we'll get started. Father, we come before you today. So thankful for the precious blood of Jesus and all that he's done for us. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you live strong and mighty on the inside of us, inside of each person that's watching today. Lord, we thank you that you are the teacher. You are the one that is bringing revealed knowledge. You're the one that's opening up our eyes to see and our ears to hear. So we ask you for that today in the precious and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Awesome. Well, you know, I'm, again, I'm just so thrilled and blessed to be here with you. And I got a few things that were just on my heart, actually, as, uh, you know, Pastor Andreas asked me to come and just share uh, for the online service. And, uh, you know, I want to just talk a little bit to you about eventually the life of honor and really winning the heart of God. And, uh, you know, especially the days that we're living in right now, I believe our focus more than ever as Christians, as believers, is to walk with God. And I know that may sound cliche to you. They may sound, you may have heard that many times before. But what I really mean by walking with God is that we are understanding the ways of God. And you know, the cool thing is, as a child of God, I can know the ways of God. That's his desire. I mean, he's a wonderful father. I'm his child, and he designed for me to know his ways. And you know, one of my favorite verses, you know, Psalm 103, verse 7, in the New Living Bible, it says this, that he, talking about God, he revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. Or another translation says it like this, he revealed his character and to Israel, he showed them his ways. And what's the difference here between Moses and the people of Israel? Well, Moses, he had an opportunity to know why God did what he did. He didn't just see the acts of God. I mean, he understood why God did what he did. He knew his character. He knew the ways of God. Whereas the people of Israel, I mean, if you think about it in the Ten Commandments that you read in the book of Exodus, what did Israel, all the people of, the, of Israel see? They saw the mighty acts of God. They saw the deeds of God. They saw when, you know, when the hail came, the hail came. They just saw what God could do. But Moses knew why God did what he did. He had his heart. And for you and I, especially as believers, as Christians, you're not called just to know all these great deeds of God, although that's wonderful. You and I are called to actually know the ways of God or His character. He's invited us into a relationship with Him to know the character behind what He does, what He does. And I don't know about you, but that's something that I'm stressing and straining towards even in my own personal life, that I don't want to just know about God. I want to know Him intimately. And you know this, when you think about this, I'm not here to serve a God to get stuff out of Him. I'm here to serve God for who He is. And I know that I can say the same about you and the same about this wonderful, amazing life church is we're not just here worshiping and serving God just to get stuff out of him because he's a really good God and he's a wonderful father that he'll just bless me whenever I want it. That's great that he wants to do that. But even if I didn't get all that stuff, I would still want the relationship. The same way maybe you husbands and wives that, man, even if I got nothing out of my relationship with my wife or Jamie, Man, I would still just want this relationship with her because I want her. She's amazing. She's a wonderful individual. Well, it's the same way with our Heavenly Father. You know, in Psalm chapter 27, verse 8, uh, the psalmist said, Lord, when you said to me, seek my face, my inner being responded, I'm seeking your face with all my heart. Now, what does his face represent? His face represents who he is or his nature or his character his hands, and if you were just to seek his hands, it simply means, you know, you're seeking his provision or what his nature and his character provides. So walking with God simply means that I get in on God's side. This is what I'm interested in knowing, and I want to get with him, and I want to understand the ways of God. And this is what I want to spend some time talking a little bit about today is learning to get on God's side. Because you know this, in the book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 3, uh, it says this, can two walk together? unless they be agreed. 
And I don't know, maybe you figured this out by now, but this is something that's really coming stronger and stronger as the days that we're seeing. And I mean, you can turn on the news for two minutes and you can see this world is nuts. This world is crazy. And I'm sure you've noticed that. And here in the world, the Bible says that it's not going to get better in the world. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 4, it talks about in the world, it gets darker and darker. But in the church, in you and I, what is it for us? Our days get brighter and brighter. So when it looks like doom and gloom out there in the world, for us as the church, it gets brighter and brighter. And this is something that we got to focus on. And how does it get brighter for us? Is that we continually walk with God walking in his ways, understanding his ways. And I'm sure I think you've understood this by now, but God is not going to join up with my way of thinking or my way of doing things, what I think is right. No, I have to jump on his boat. God is not going to jump and leave his to jump onto my boat, which got holes in it in my thinking. There may be wrong ideas or motives. God is not going to be part of what I'm doing. He's calling you and I to jump over to what he's doing, to jump over into how he thinks, to jump over how he acts. And in doing so, we're going to get godly results. So this is one of the things that we need to do is we need to come humbly before our heavenly father, our wonderful father, and simply come to Him and allow Him to show that we need to make adjustments in our life in any kind of area. Now, anybody ever have adjustments being taken before? I know I've had some adjustments in my personal life being looked after, but even in a physical sense, anybody ever gone to a chiropractor before? Well, you go to a chiropractor, and what do they do? They just, they straighten you out, right? They crack you here, crack you over there. And why do they do that? Well, maybe to relieve some pain, but really just to straighten some things out again. But if there's pain in your body, the reason why you go is simply because if you don't get it adjusted, it causes more pain in other areas of your life. So what we're doing this morning, when we start making the proper adjustments to start thinking like God and start acting like God, then we're going to start thinking and seeing right. And simply then life starts to make sense. So the question I want to ask us today is, getting on God's side, how do I get on God's side? How do I make these adjustments? How do I get adjusted? And it's real simple. It's an exchange of thoughts that have to take place. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, it says this in the New Living Bible. It says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God. Come on, say it with me. Let God. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. So how am I going to make adjustments? How am I going to see adjustments in my life? How is it going to change going to be taking place in my life? It comes by exchanging my thoughts with God's thoughts. I think that's wonderful. How do I get on God's sides? It's just simply by going to his word humbly and allowing what he says in his word to now be the dominant thought in my life. It's not some complicated thing. It's not by me just praying or fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Oh God, I just want to be changed. I just want to be a different person. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with you and I getting into the presence of Jesus with our Bible intact, go to the word of God, find out what he thinks about a situation and now aligning my life to what he says. This is the key for you and I. We've got to allow the Word of God to align how to think, align us in how to speak, and align us in how to act. This is what you and I are called to do. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Be imitators of God as dear children. Well, how can you imitate a God that you're not spending time with? you got to spend time with Him to see what God thinks, to see what God does, to hear what God says. And in doing so, you and I are able to imitate Him in this, in this crazy world, what do people need? They need Jesus now more than ever. And I know you've heard this said many times before, but the only Jesus some people will ever see is the Jesus that's on the inside of you. So I want to make sure that I'm representing the proper Jesus to the world around me and not just someone that I figuratively made up in my own thinking. So we got to get back to the Bible. Come on, say it with me. Get back to the Bible. Life would just make sense if Christians went back to regular Bible reading and just spent time in the presence of Jesus by being in His Word. Now here, let me just mention this. Because who? the question I want to ask you is, who is influencing your thought life? If we don't intentionally make the time to be with God and allow His Word to shape our thoughts, by default, the world and its ways are molding you and I into its custom. And this is where we're going against, right where Romans 12 says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. Why? It doesn't work. Doesn't make sense at all. Their way of living is totally different than God's way of living. 
Remember, you've came out of the kingdom of darkness and you are now part of the kingdom of God's dear son. You're in a brand new kingdom. So you and I, we've got to take the time to learn how to operate in this kingdom. And there's only one way that you learn how to do that is by getting in the presence of Jesus. And what you're doing right now this morning, watching online, or if you're able to come to a live service here at Life Church, that's what, what you're doing is you're actually taking the time for God's word to get in on the inside of you, get heaven's culture on the inside of you so that you and I can start living the lifestyle that he has already called us to live. Let me just give you this one more reality and we'll jump into talking about honor, honor here. But a reality is anytime that your thinking is contrary to what this word says, guess who's wrong? It's not God, so it's you or I. Anytime that my thinking goes contrary to what this says, guess what? I'm wrong. And so what do I need to do? I need to now simply humble myself and say, Lord, I do not know what all. I thank you for your thought. Thank you for what you say regarding this situation. I'm going to apply it to my life. And that's where change takes place. And when you start thinking like God, start acting like God, guess what? You get God's results. And that's what we're looking for. And that's the blessing that you and I have the privilege of being is just like our father. So this morning, what I want to do is just talk to you about honor, simply because God is a God of honor. Everything he does is honorable. And the reason why I want to talk about honor is because with honor comes great reward. Great reward. And, uh, you know, in 2 John, uh, there's only one chapter in it. So 2 John 1 verse 8. And I, want you, I really want you to see this. If you got a Bible with you, pull it out. I want you to look at this verse and just really get your eyes zoned in on it, maybe meditate on it throughout the week. You really need to see this because the Apostle John now, he's encouraging us believers and he says some powerful words here. Chapter one, verse eight, he says, be on your guard so that you do not lose all that you have diligently worked for, but receive a full reward. Now I see the first four words in that I'm reading to you here from the Passion Bible. It says, be on your guard. You know, many times throughout Scripture, you see many different types of phrasing kind of along those lines. You'll see, look to yourselves. You'll see, watch out or stay alert. And anybody ever read some of those verses before? I mean, you can see those on a regular basis. And he's telling you and I, be on our guard. That means this is my responsibility, right? With the kingdom of God that we're in, there's a God side and then there's a man side. There's always two parts to the coin, right? God will always do his part. I got to make sure that I fulfill my part of the, of the plan as well, right? So right here, what we see in 2 John chapter 1, verse 8, my part is just to be on guard. Now, what am I on guard for in my life? The answer to that is that I receive the full reward for my life. It's my job to align myself with the ways of God in order that I receive a full reward. Come on, say it with me, full reward. Again, full reward. We want the full reward that you've diligently worked so hard for. In every area of my life, I want to ensure that my life's choices are connected to the Word of God so that when my defining moment comes, I'm ready. Now, the last part of this verse, again, that you receive a full reward. I want you to remember, <clears throat> excuse me, God is a rewarder. That's who He is. God is a rewarder. <clears throat> You know, you see that in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, it says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And anyone who wants to come to God must believe, must believe this, one of two things, must believe that He is and must believe that He is a rewarder to them who diligently seek Him. Everything that we're doing in this life, whether, you know, the, the, as, as a believer, whatever you do, when you're sharing the gospel, when you're doing a good job in the, in the business that you have, or you're doing a good job as an employee to a different company, everything you're doing is for one day that we're going to stand before the Lord and give an account for our lives. This is a big deal. And I mean, if you again look at this word, full reward, if I can get a full reward, that also means that I could get a partial reward, or it also means I could get no reward. So what I want to do right now in my, in my time that I have with you this morning, I kind of want to just get your, your taste buds going here a little bit so that you do a little bit of more study. I'm going to just basically bring it to the, the trough to take a drink. And it's, I, want, I want to encourage you really to dive into some of these things because I want to talk about these three areas right now to, from the scriptures showing you a partial reward, a no reward, and a full reward scenarios. This is a big deal and it is all connected to honor. 
So what I want you to do, go to Mark chapter 6 here for a moment. And the first one I want to do is talk to you about a partial reward. Now, again, I want you to keep in mind, God is a rewarder. Remember when, just before I read Mark chapter 6, remember when David uh, killed Goliath? You know, a lot of times if you read a lot of the backstory, and sometimes you can kind of read over some of these things, but David asked three different times, hey, what does the guy get whoever kills this giant? And again, what did they do three different times? He heard the reward for killing this, uh, uh, this, this Philistine, Goliath. And what was the reward? Number one, you tax is free. You get tax free. And number two, you get the king's daughter. So, I mean, again, this 17-year-old kid all of a sudden, hey, hey, who does the win- what does the winner get when he uh, you know, defeats this, this giant? Uh, first of all, tax free. He's like, okay, cool. Get the king's daughter. Say, what? I get the king's daughter? Yeah, you do. That's the reward for doing what, you, what we're asking you to do. So in, in, involved in all this, yeah, I mean, of course, he was fighting for the name of God. But there was also incentive behind it. He was going to get tax free and the daughter and the daughter of a king. I mean, I mean, parents, you that are watching, I'm sure you do the same thing with your children, right? You are constantly giving rewards. If you, hey, children, if you can stop fighting in this, hey, you're going to be able to get that. Whatever it may look like, but the incentive is good. That's a good thing. Everything that you and I are doing on this life is for one day to stand before Jesus and give an account for it. There's nothing wrong with that. And because God is a wonderful rewarder. So now let's look here in Mark chapter 6, talking about a partial reward. And let's pick it up in verse 1. It says, Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then look at verse 4. Then Jesus told them, uh, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Now let's just jump in here for a sec again. I want you to look at verse 5 again with me. I'm going to read it to you. I believe this is the Passion Bible. It says, Now, he could do no mighty work there, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Did you catch that in verse 5 again? Did Did you hear that? He says, He could not do mighty work there. The Bible does not say he would not do mighty work there. Now, if Jesus, if the Word of God would have said like this, that Jesus would not do any mighty work there? Well, that deals with the will of Jesus. But because the Word doesn't say that, the Word says He could do no mighty work. That means that Jesus wasn't withholding. He was restrained. I really want you to catch that this morning. (laughs) Jesus wasn't withholding the miracles. He wasn't withholding uh, the amazing mighty works. What was happening to him? Jesus was being restrained. And that word restrained, simply in the dictionary, in our English dictionary, it simply means this, to be kept under control or to simply be put into a box or limited. So it could read it like this, that Jesus was controlled, he was limited, and he couldn't perform any mighty work. Didn't say he wouldn't, it says that he couldn't. And again, why couldn't Jesus do any mighty work? Simply because this, the people in his hometown didn't recognize Jesus for who he is. They saw him according to his upbringing, right? Verse three, it says this, isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this the carpenter, the brother of Jacob, Joseph, Judah, and Simon? And don't his sisters here live among us? Didn't he play on my kid's soccer team? Didn't he the one that made our kitchen table? Isn't he the one that was in my science class? They didn't know Jesus according to the Spirit. They just simply saw him for what he was. They saw him for his upbringing, right? What did they do? They had created a mental image of how the coming Messiah was going to appear from their understanding of the Old Testament. You know, the Pharisees did the exact same thing. They, every time that they saw Jesus, when, when they heard, sorry, not Jesus, when they thought of the Messiah coming to, to relieve Israel from everything that was going on under the Roman government, They saw a conquering Messiah, one who would come powerfully to deliver Israel from Roman oppression. And instead, what did they do? They mocked Jesus because he was an untrained man. 
all of Nazareth. Think about this. They didn't recognize this man, Jesus. The leading priests of that day had no idea who he was, even though Jesus was performing miracles at that time that nobody else had ever seen. So why, again, the question is, why couldn't Jesus do any mighty work? It's because the people in his hometown didn't recognize him for who he was. And number two, the people didn't honor Jesus. Again, verse four, Jesus said this, a prophet is treated with honor everywhere except in his own hometown. Now, what's that word honor mean? In the Greek, it simply means timi. Now, the word honor, timi, to translate it back to English from timi, it simply means to value, to have appreciation, to esteem, or to respect. This is what it is. And you know, sometimes to understand a word, uh, you have to look at the opposite, right? Or the antonym of the word honor is simply dishonor, and it's the Greek word atomia. And atomia simply means this, to show no respect or value. Now hear this out, to treat as common or ordinary. Now, I don't know about you, but this just was a wake-up call for me. Again, Jesus is not withholding mighty works. He couldn't do them. He was restrained. Why? Because the people there saw him as common. They saw him as ordinary. I mean, I don't know about you, but this, I, even for my own personal self, I have to give my head a shake. How many times have I walked in to a church service or I walked in to a building where we were able to worship God together and I just treated it as, as a common thing? The same way that I walk into McDonald's is the same way that I walk into church. You know, the same way that I, you know, go to the park is the same way that I talk to somebody. It, it's just ordinary. It's just common, right? And I think what has happened over this period of time, these last months that we weren't able to gather the way that we normally have gathered, I really hope and I believe that a lot of people saw what they were actually missing. What we have here in the gathering is where the power lies. It's not just simply, you know, going to church makes, you know, you can check it off the box that makes us powerful. No, 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 no. Scrap that. We're not playing church anymore. What we're here for, we are here on an assignment to get a job done. And it's in our gathering, man, that makes us powerful. It's vital that you and I get together. It's vital that you stay connected to Life Church. It's vital that you continue to hear the words from your pastors, right? They got a word for you in season that you need to hold on, you need to grasp, and you need to apply to your life because God is speaking to you through your pastors. It's the most powerful thing. And again, all of that has to go back to honor. How are we treating the things of God? How do we value it? Do we respect it? Do we respect the word that's on your lap? Or maybe you're seeing it on the screen. Do you honor this? Are you holding it in high esteem? Because when you do, it'll work for you and I. So again, this is a, a big check for me and in my own personal life is that I got to make sure, am I valuing this word higher than any kind of word that's out there? Any kind of doctor, any kind of physician, any kind of expert that's out there, does God's word still have a higher place in my life than the word of any expert that's out there? Because that's a question you need to answer for your own self. Because if it's not or on the same platform, then we're missing it. His word should be far above every thought, idea, opinion that people may have. His word is my first of first word. His word is my final word. And his word is everything in between. All right, I know you're standing and shouting, amen. I know you're doing that. But I, I'm, I'm getting stirred up just trying to get this to you and I, because church is no longer good enough for you and I just to play church. We've got to get the job done. We are here for such a time as this. And the word of God is going to see us through. The word of God is going to equip us for everything we need to do to finish the task while we're down here. It's a little bit off topic, but that's just wanted to get that out. Now, just going back here again to the, the people of Nazareth, just, just think about this. The people of Nazareth withheld honor from Jesus. They didn't treat him as valuable or precious. Rather, they saw an ordinary man, a common local boy, standing in front of them. And because they saw him like this, they only received a partial reward because they, they had restrained Jesus. Now, Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, filled with God's Spirit without measure, he was sent to heal all who were oppressed of the devil, could not, say with me, could not fulfill this commission, not because it wasn't God's will, but because they restricted him by withholding honor, and therefore he could only do a few mighty things. Man, compared to what this Jesus can do, compared to what the God of all gods can do, compared to the exceeding greatness, this God is amazing. He can do anything he wants. But here's the thing. He was withheld. 
He was restricted because they refused to honor him and hold him in that position in their personal lives. And so the result is partial reward. Man, that's a big deal. Now, let's just keep going on here a little bit. Now, I want you to look at Luke chapter 5. Let's just go there quick. And let's talk about the no reward situation here for a moment. And in Luke chapter 5, and let's look here at verse 17. It says, One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Now, if you actually look in the New King James Version and a few other translations, it says that the power of God was present to heal them. Now, we got to identify who are the them that this verse is talking about. Well, if you again, you look at this, who are the people that showed up in verse 17? It's the religious leaders. It's the, it's the Pharisees. It's the scribes of religious law. They were there hearing the, the teaching of Jesus, but it says that the power of Jesus, the power of God, sorry, the power of God was present with Jesus to heal them. So that means somebody in that crowd, some religious leader, some Pharisee needed the healing power of God in their life. Maybe it was a physical thing. Maybe it was a mental thing. Regardless of what it was, it says that the healing power of Jesus or God was present with Jesus to heal that individual. Now let's continue on here. Verse 18, it says, Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Now, let me just pause there for a sec. Verse 21, where did the Pharisees miss it? In the, in the New Living Bible, in, in Luke, Luke's account of this, it says that the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, in Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 9, I believe it's verse 3, it says that they said within themselves, or in Mark's account of this same story in chapter 2, verse 6, I think it is, it says that they were reasoning in their hearts. So notice, what did the Pharisees do? They said to themselves, they said within themselves, or they were reasoning in their hearts. Now notice this, the religious leaders didn't yell all these nasty things at Jesus. They didn't criticize him aloud. They dishonored Jesus by their thoughts. They spoke within themselves. So this shows me that honor is given in deed, it's given in word, but it's also given in thought. So now let me just finish a story here for you. From Mark's account in Mark chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so we asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man, stand up, Pick up your mat and go home. And if you see the rest of that, what did they do? Everybody marveled. They were amazed going, wow, man, have you seen anything like this? This is amazing. Here, again, notice this for the scenario for this, the no reward scenario. The paralyzed man got up and he walked. All the Pharisees were amazed, as we just said, and glorified God, but not one of them was healed. These men received no reward because they dishonored Jesus in their thoughts, even though Jesus was there to heal them. Jesus wasn't even there necessarily to heal that man that came down on that walker. He was there to heal them. But what happened? They missed it because they withheld honor. They refused to see Jesus as valuable. They refused to see the word as important in their life, to see it that's higher than anything else. So the result was not able to experience anything. And that's a sad place to be. Now, for the good news, I have a few minutes left with you. Look at Matthew chapter 8. Let's turn there real quick. And in Matthew 8, this we see the account of a man who actually received the full reward of God for his honor, for his respect for Jesus. And you know, I think why, I mean, I'm just kind of giving you the tip of the iceberg here this morning. 
There's so much more to be talked about, so much more to go into. But honor is such a big deal because in these last days, if you read 2 Timothy chapter 3, you actually see the dishonor that is in our culture. Anything that is worthy of praise, anything that is sacred, the world has completely dishonored it. There's no respect for the things of God. There's no respect for the ways of God. And you know what? It's happening. I mean, this, the thing that we have to be aware of as church folk is that we don't just, they kind of see that and kind of, kind of jump in, 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 in their boat and how they view it or how they would think of it as well. We've got to make sure the things that God calls sacred, it's sacred to us. Why is that? Is it because we're, we're so stuck up and religious? No, we're not doing it in that spirit. But we are doing it in the heart of because God thinks it's important, it's important to me. What God says is valuable, it's valuable to me. So we got to make sure we stick with what his word says, because if you always stay on God's side, you'll be okay. You'll win out. So we are going to just stay with God, stay with his ways, stay with him, and you'll be okay. Okay, in Matthew chapter 8, I'm going to look at verse 5 here. It says, Jesus returned to Capernaum, and a Roman officer came and pleaded with him, saying, Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed and in terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And you skip down to verse 13. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go back home because you believed it has happened. And the young servant was healed that same hour. Now, what I want you to again to notice, I want you to get your eyes on verses eight and nine here for a second. And the reason why is because right here, the centurion, he explains how and why what he asked for would work. Are you ready? This, this is a big deal, okay? Verse 89 again, it says, the officer, what is he coming for? He said, I have a servant that's sick and I need him well. So Jesus said, I'll come, I'll come to your house and I'll heal him. And the servant said, well, well, wait a minute. I'm not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. Now notice the next three words in verse nine. I know this. These are powerful, faith-filled words. He was convinced of something. I know that I, what I asked you is going to happen simply because I'm a man under authority. I'm a man under authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. And I only need to say, go, and they go, come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. He understood authority. He understood who he's under. He understood who he's over. And therefore, he knew his servant would be healed because of his position and his understanding of authority. Again, what I'm doing this morning is just giving you the tip of the iceberg. So let me just give this out to you. But let me just show you why this worked. This centurion had the respect and obedience of his soldiers because he honored his commanding officer by submitting to his authority. Number two, he enjoyed the backing of a superior officer who in turn was backed by the authority of Rome. Let me just kind of simplify it like this, saying it this way. The centurion said, I know this is going to work because I have authority. I honor my country and my superiors by respecting their authority. So all I have to do is speak a word and those that are under me respond immediately to my directives. He knew the authority. So the centurion recognized, what did he do? He recognized the authority of God on Jesus. Now this is so important, just to take a little side trail, it's so important that you recognize the authority of God on your pastors. It's there, it's evident. You can see it all across this. The leadership team here at Life Church, you can see the authority of God on, these, on this house, on this Life Church. It's powerful, it's there. So rather than just kind of seeing ordinary people that are serving and leading this church well, I want you to see them with the authority of God that's on their life. It'll change the way you approach church. Again, that's just a tidbit for you to, to, you to enjoy and chew on a little bit. Now also the centurion, he knew Jesus exercised authority in the unseen spiritual realm, just as he exercised authority in the military realm. This is why the centurion understood all that Jesus needed to do was to give a simple command and the infirmity would have to obey. 
It was no different than those under his authority responding quickly to his orders. And we saw Jesus' response in verse 10. He says, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Man, that's a big statement. What made this centurion have great faith? The honor he extended toward Jesus and his understanding of authority. This is why he knew he was going to get it. And again, this all ties in with honor. So this man received a full reward because he gave honor and understood authority. He regarded, for, or sorry, his regard for authority revealed a foundation of respect in his heart and the root of his motivation was honor. And so just in closing, why is honor such a big deal to God? Because it's a spiritual law. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30, God says this. He says, those that honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So here's the thing. Those that, God, those that honor God, what's going to happen? God will honor them. Everyone that you see, I want to encourage you, go through these gospels. And everyone that honored Jesus received from God in the proportion to the honor that was given. Well, you say, well, I thought it was faith. Yeah, but you can't have, believe in anyone unless there's respect or honor for somebody. It's all tied. It's all connected to this. And let me just read the last part of this to you again. In 1 Samuel 2, verse 30, in the NIV translation, it says that those, this is God speaking. Remember, this is a spiritual law. Those that honor me, God said, I will honor. Those who despise me will be disdained. Disdain then, really, in our English, bio, or English dictionary, it says the feeling that someone is unworthy of one's consideration or respect. So let me just paint this out to you. God considers those who dishonor him as beneath his notice. This would imply a disregard for their needs and for their prayers. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to be that individual that has no honor towards God, no honor towards his way. I respect God, and the result is he's going to respect me. Let me just pray for you this morning. Father, we love you so much. Thank you that your word continues to bring clarity and light to our eyes. So, Father, we ask you right now in the precious name of Jesus that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the deep and intimate knowledge of you, that we are a church, that we are your people who walk honorably first and foremost, that we have great reverence and respect for you, but not only just for you, but also your ways. And so, Father, we love you this morning. We give you praise, and I thank you for every individual, every family, every household that is watching this morning. I speak life. I speak blessing over them in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, thank you that your blessing, it says, shall follow them everywhere that they go. So, Lord, thank you for equipping us. Thank you for revealing things to us. We give you the praise. We give you the honor for it in Jesus' mighty name.
Thanks again so much for joining us. We hope you had an awesome time, that worship was inspiring, that the message encouraged you. Hey, if you'd like to find any more of our content or get connected with things through the week, whether it's kids program or social media, whatever, we encourage you to visit thisislifechurch.com. Have an awesome rest of your week.